next session. Let's welcome our panel. We are going to be discussing COVID and PLG in the future of SAS. So we have Elas, he is the co-founder and co CEO of Owiwi. We have Sujan Patel, he's the co-founder of Mailshake. We have Andy Murad, he's the head of marketing at EXB Group. We have Semiet, who is the VP of sales at Signal Group, and James McWalter, the director of growth at Respondent. So hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Hello, hey. pleasure to be here. Hi there. All right. So I'd love to start off with you, Elias, and ask how being a founder at a successful startup that is interrelated with human resources, which trends that you are seeing in the SaaS industry during during this COVID pandemic? Well, it's been an extremely interesting sort of quarter, so to speak. Um, I don't think any of us were really prepared for, for what happened and how things transpired. Uh, I have, feel like I have to say as a sort of disclaimer beforehand that HR departments are not used to seeing innovation. It's what I believe to be one of the most sort of innovation starved functions of business. So to me, the way that I saw COVID and, and trying to remain optimistic as well is that this was a great opportunity for them to get up to speed with the amount of technology and the amount of tools that are out there and available. Uh, and that they immediately sort of um, reached a new level of sort of a new style of working, um, uh, working from home. Uh, in general terms, uh, what we saw was that uh, pre-COVID rather, um, it was an extremely interesting field that was growing tremendously. Obviously COVID put a huge stop on that and especially with regards to recruitment. But uh, now I'm starting to see, and we're starting to see that, well, for the first case, there were a lot of companies that adapted really fast and in fact, didn't sort of pause or change their, their operations. Uh, and only now recently can I say that I've seen a lot more companies sort of getting back into the rhythm and uh, um, into the spirit of sort of uh, recovering from the crisis. Uh, but with that being said, for we uh, was actually a sort of super, super busy period for us uh, because the one aspect of recruitment that we could continue doing without sort of causing any delays was the actual screening part, which could happen all online. Obviously, this was further facilitated then by uh, video interviewing tools, which um, and, and other tools like Zoom, for example, that uh, really experienced high tremendous waves of growth. Uh, but all in all, it's something that uh, I like to see the positives out of this experience. And I think that um, as far as the way was concerned, we were able to sort of uh, remain relevant despite the crisis uh, in many ways. Wow, that's fantastic. And to be very specific, have there been any verticals or which vertical in particular has shown growth despite this pandemic? Well, for the most part, video interviewing tools have seen a tremendous rate of growth. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's what, that's what I've noticed and uh, particular screening tools because, you know, it's either for trying to use it in order to facilitate your hiring decisions or to buy yourself some time with the candidates that have applied for a position and are now sort of on, on hold and uh, frozen. Uh, I think it was a very sort of anything to do, especially with um, employee engagement and culture assessment also, uh, I think, saw high waves of growth. Uh, other tools like applicant tracking systems, not so much because most departments and most companies were using those already. Uh, but for the most part, I would say things that facilitated the screening process uh, and anything else to do with it sort of uh, engaging with the existing workforce. And that could be a myriad of different things. It could be culture-based assessments, or it could be um, training and development, another sort of um, area that saw a lot of growth because, you know, the time was well spent. Uh, although most of the time there, it would happen through sort of the bigger providers like LinkedIn. Um, so that's at least from what I saw from my observation. Awesome. And do you think that these trends are here to stay, or will they dominate the future? I hope they stay. Uh, it's like what I said, uh, HR hasn't seen a lot of innovation, so it's really nice to see how HR managers are becoming more and more uh, or like well-oriented with technology and are becoming more comfortable. I understand the argument that you know HR and business in general is, is people-oriented, um, but the use of technology was something that was, I think, lacking uh, in existing processes. So I think that now with what's happened is... Um, 
HR managers will be better equipped and able to adapt more quickly uh, to new technologies and new trends. And I think uh, it was a good wake up call in some ways. Yeah, it's really interesting, um, especially I just saw the news that a lot of our big tech companies like Twitter or Facebook, they're allowing their company, they're allowing their employees to even remain remote afterwards. So I wonder how that's going to change the hiring process for those teams. Too. Yeah, well, one of the things is that, uh, especially in Greece, um, you know, working from home was not a sort of well, it wasn't an established way of working. Obviously, there's a lot of companies that do it, and especially startups, it's something that, um, you know, if you're accustomed to it, like we are, it, it was business as usual. There was no disruption in that case. But uh, I would like to think that many companies, not just in Greece, around the world, will be able to uh, adopt these practices and establish them as sort of, you know, go-to uh, uh, policies. Because at the end of the day, uh, I think what helped facilitate that is the fact that, you know, most people don't like remote working because they can't supervise or micromanage their employees. So there's the aspect of trust, uh, whereas, you know, given the circumstances, you had to believe that the other person was doing their job. And I think that once managers saw that people were, in some cases, even more productive than they were beforehand, that that was real food for thought for them to say, wait a minute, maybe we can actually keep some of the workforce working remotely. And then since that makes them happy, you know, even better for us, others cannot adapt to working from home. So we have to definitely bring them back to the office and maybe follow up with some kind of other initiative um, if they're at risk, uh, psychologically speaking, from working from home. Uh, and then you'll have the the people who, you know, perform in both cases and you can provide a more flexible working environment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it'll be interesting to see how the future, future pans out. Yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy. Hi, um, so being an expert in digital transformation and a SaaS marketing leader with heavy experience in the field, what do you think are going to be the effects of the digital transformation in our industry? Well, I guess like digital transformation right now went from being just a general concept, something that you would see like on paper, right, to something that companies realize, okay, it's something concrete, it's something that requires us to change processes, right? So <clears throat> up to, you know, a few months ago, everybody says, okay, we are, we are trying to digitize our business. We are proceeding, you know, we have digital transformation processes and transformation in place and stuff like that, but they never realized what that actually entailed, right? So it was more like a lot of words, buzzwords, and customer experience, customer journey mapping, and stuff like that, until you realize that suddenly your customers are not going to come to you, right? So you have to be available anytime, anywhere. So it's the first time that companies realized what actually, what digital transformation actually is, right? So having this kind of like digital interface and processes so that everything happens like frictionless, right? So we need this kind of frictionless transactions throughout the customer journey. And for the first time, you really see uh, what it means, right? In previous session, you guys talked about high touch and low touch onboarding and processes and stuff like that. Right now, everything uh, one to many or one to one communication happens remotely in one way or another. And uh, and everything from negotiations to implementation to deployment to strategy occurs like you know remotely and uh and companies like winners of this uh let's say uh disruption are those companies that either already had processes in place you know to to uh interact with customers uh like that or companies with which are uh quickly adapting to the new um environment and have you spoken to companies that did not have that in place and how are they adapting <laughs> yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, there are a few companies that are not able to cope with the current situation because of either uh, regulations, right, especially when it comes to enterprise customers and stuff like that, and you have like a bunch of regulations that limits the scope of action when it comes to transformation and digital processes, or because of internal decision-making processes and, you know, uh, especially old-fashioned companies, it takes forever to actually change something. But you know what? I, 
in a way it's kind of positive because as as mentioned multiple times companies are visiting the, the whole perspective on how they carry out operations right and um and you see that on both both sides right so vendors and and customers um what i noticed uh you know what that's really interesting is that there's this kind of no bs culture right now because people are a lot more cautious right when they buy a new solution so in the past you would go there with your products and you had a great demo or something like that people would test it out and so on and it would just give it a go right now we have to be a lot more cautious both because we don't have the budget we used to have to purchase technology secondly because we don't have the time we have a, a lot of other problems to uh take care of so at the same time uh people who are like decision makers when they introduce technology they are a lot more careful and they really have this kind of like new attitude which is like uh it doesn't matter what you tell me or what i see i want to see an immediate effect right so this kind of like uh change in um attitude in the purchase uh like in the decision making process and in the purchasing process it's really interesting and that forces companies to really uh really uh deliver on the promises they uh they make which is good right it's actually it's very positive and uh, and companies are adapting uh dramatically so um and like we we Refocusing on their positioning, or focusing on their, um, for example, content and how they can provide immediate value. You can't say just, you know, uh, we can start now, and because you know the situation requires companies to act quickly, and so um, companies are adapting. One of those things that I I've noticed is all of the companies, even clothing companies, they're they're responding with emails being like, this is our response to the COVID pandemic and they're trying to adapt as well with that. So I think it's really interesting. Um, given this adapting, do you think there's like going to be a rise towards the PLG transformation in the future? Uh, say it again, sorry. Do you think that there will be a rise towards PLG? Um, yes and no. Uh, uh, I guess like it's funny that this kind of crisis also showed the importance of like this kind of like direct relationship with the customers right so yes definitely your product has to convince your product has the uh you know everything has to be centered to uh uh to you know to deliver a a, a an extraordinary product experience but at the same time we also like see how like we we miss this kind of like connection with people and um and you know uh, and the whole process like the old processes of really interacting throughout different stages and i guess it really depends on you know the company size right for example um true for example enterprise customers they're slowly decentralizing uh purchasing decisions and stuff like that but you still need this kind of sales old-fashioned marketing sales approach let's say uh together with your product-led strategy right so yes definitely uh but at the same time with um yeah with smbs and smaller companies uh absolutely uh plg is uh still going to um uh, be the the uh trend over time all right good and considering that user experience is the number one um, criteria for B2B organizations and B2C as well. Can you talk about how COVID has actually changed that? Well, I think uh, companies, um, obviously, so right now, first of all, I think there's a big problem in uh, taking care of customers, right? So uh, also for companies that have a limited number of people who can work and organ organizing different structures and different teams is a bit more complicated. Um, so obviously, uh, people rely on uh, fantastic products that sell themselves and the users can interact with uh, independently, right? And yeah. at the same time, uh, think about it, uh, there's a huge problem right now also with uh, training technology. Um, as for example, I can introduce new software at my company, but my team now is scattered everywhere. So I have to make sure that people will end up understanding how the new solution works and how it, it 
you know, and how they can profit from it. So basically new vendors either have like specific uh, solutions in place to uh, carry out like, um, for example, uh, remote training of some sort of some, or they have a, you know, extremely uh, um, intuitive uh, user interface, which also makes the whole user experience a bit uh, more frictionless, or they have systems in place like a digital adoption platform or something like that to make sure it works uh, more like effortlessly for the end users. And, uh, but generally speaking, user experience still remains one of the USPs, especially with SMBs, obviously, but we see that slowly also in enterprise customers, right? And enterprise customers, like a few years ago, they didn't have like that kind of like decision, like they didn't have scope for decision like SMB, right? They would choose a solution that would integrate with legacy systems. Um, you know, there are still companies out there with uh, Windows 2000, right? So, and, and ME or whatever, and uh, Vista, oh my God. And, <laughs> And, <laughs> well, that's actually the norm in most of the companies, yep. actually, you know, enterprise customers, for customers, you know, or maybe edge, well, and, uh, and the fact is that these companies, before they had to deal only with, you know, problems connected to legacy systems and stuff like that, so there was no choice. Now that they're opening up a little bit, obviously, even for such large customers, the choice is always like, uh, what makes my users happier because employees often complain you know and uh, employee experience is becoming an important component of the whole digital transformation and if the employee experience is bad companies know people will leave and eventually they will also use ux as the uh, important criterion to choose a solution i love that thank you very much